In this presentation, we'll go through the best practice for capturing Structure from Motion datasets. Structure from Motion is solely based on photographs, and as a general principle, photographs should cover the subject from all sides and different angles. This is necessary in order to extract three-dimensional information and generate 3D models. The number of photographs that is adequate in order to cover an artifact or a building should be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Taking more photographs than needed, although can be useful if, for example, you realize in the processing stage that a particular angle has not been covered, it cannot be seen as a solution to compensate for missing angles or missing parts. Therefore, it is better to design beforehand what angles and approximately how many photographs are required in order to adequately cover a building, a surface or a smaller object. It is important to remember that you need to capture your object or scene from different positions and angles. In this case, let's assume that you have to capture an isolated object, for example, a sculpture or a column. In the example on the left, the photographs are taken only from four positions. This means that certain areas and angles that might have been better captured from a different position will not be adequately photographed and therefore your 3D model might end up having less resolution and details or even holes in the areas not captured adequately. Although the requirements for each object can only be identified on a case-by-case -case basis, ideally your capturing would be closer to the example on the right. It is essential to capture your scene from every possible position and angle, essentially creating a hemisphere around the object. See here, for example, we need to capture the column. The blue rectangles indicate the position from where its photo was taken. As you can see, photographs are taking a hemisphere around the column, moving both horizontally and vertically around the object. In this example, Let's assume that you want to capture an interior space. The principle is the same as before. You need to move to different parts of the space rather than to take multiple photos from the same position. In the example on the left side, photographs are only taken from the four corners, whereas on the example on the right, photographs are taken by multiple positions along the four sides of the space. The latter, which is the correct process, will ensure that the subject matter is captured from several angles that will provide a sufficient overlap between your images and enough three-dimensional information for its digital reconstruction. You should note that the hemisphere principle also applies to this case since images should also be captured from different angles, both horizontally and vertically. What you see here is a point cloud produced by the software Agisoft Metashape in the first processing stage in which it tries to identify common points between the images. The blue rectangles indicate the locations from where the photos were taken. As you can observe, the hemisphere principle has not been followed here. Rather, multiple images have been taken by the same location. Although this may still give you enough three-dimensional information, it makes processing more time-consuming and, most importantly, geometry errors can be more easily introduced. In this example, you are capturing a surface. Let's assume the facade of a building. As in the example before, you need to make sure that you photograph the facade from different positions by moving along the surface rather than taking multiple pictures from the same position. Capturing small objects is more difficult than capturing a larger scene. Although the principles remain the same, more attention should be paid to the lighting of the object. It is important to light the object evenly to eliminate shadows and reflections. To achieve that, it is suggested to use a light box and create a dome light effect. This can be done if you use three sources of light, one from the top and two from the sides. All lights should have the same intensity and color, creating a similar effect to that of exterior light on a bright cloudy day. Light boxes are commonly used for product photography and therefore you should be able to find them quite cheaply in photography shops or online. You can also create a DIY light box by using a cardboard box, cutting out its four sides and the top and using a white translucent fabric 
to cover the gaps. See for example the two DIY light boxes here. The white fabric helps in the diffusion of light, eliminating harsh shadows and reflections. Here you see a light box in which the lights are integrated. Although such light boxes are more convenient to buy and use, portable lights will give you more flexibility as you would be able to move them to different positions and control their intensity depending on the object you are photographing. As you may have realized already, working with a light box will not give you the flexibility you would have when working in an open space. Due to the light box structure, you cannot move around the object. What you need, however, to do is to keep your camera still, ideally on a tripod, and photograph the object by rotating it. To make this easier for you, you are advised to use a rotating table, such as a Lazy Susan that is typically used for serving food. This will allow you not only to rotate the object without moving the camera, but will also minimize your contact with the object. This is especially important when you record fragile artifacts. You may want to cover the rotating table with a fabric or a paper that will create some contrast with the object. As in the previous examples, you need to capture a hemisphere around the object. To achieve this with small objects, you should take multiple pictures by rotating the object on the horizontal axis and repeating the capturing by moving the camera in the vertical axis. You will need photographs from at least two to three different angles depending on the complexity of the object. What is very important to remember when capturing small objects is that their background should be removed by creating masks. This is because the object will be moving by rotating on its axis, however, the background will be staying the same. This can corrupt your project in the processing states. To be able to more efficiently remove the background, you should always remember to take a picture of your scene without the object, since this can help you automate the process of creating masks. Otherwise, you will need to manually draw a mask for its image. We will see how to do the masking in the following lesson on processing. As we mentioned earlier, the 3D model entirely depends on the photographs taken. In this example, the base of the figurine is not visible. Therefore, in order to have a full 3D model of the artifact, you need to flip over the object and repeat the capturing process. Because some objects may not be able to properly stand when inverted, it is suggested to use a piece of floral foam to stabilize the object. Floral foam is soft enough to not damage the object and will also leave no traces. Let's now move to some rules and structure from motion protocols that will help you capture the best quality dataset. First of all, you don't need any sophisticated equipment to capture a structure of a motion dataset. You can do it with a DSLR camera, compact camera, or even your smartphone. Even a relatively low resolution camera can give you a good quality dataset. However, you should note that a higher resolution dataset will result in a better quality 3D model. In the computational imaging unit, we have referred to the different image formats and the reasons why you should capture a dataset with the best possible resolution. A few things to refresh your memory. RAW files are not compressed or processed by the camera and give you more control when post-processing an image. Depending on the camera manufacturer, RAW may be called something different. For example, in Nikon cameras, RAW is called NEF, whereas in Canon it's called CRW or CR2. Despite the difference in name, they have the same qualities. TIFF files, on the other hand, although they are compressed, they don't lose any information during compression. You should note, however, that TIFF files are quite large and in most cases are not suitable for the web. Lastly, we have JPEGs. JPEGs are the most common image file format. Contrary to the other two, JPEGs lose information during compression, which on the one hand means that you will get a smaller image file, but also an image with lower quality. In most cameras, 
you can select the amount of compression that is applied to JPEG images. Therefore, if you have no option rather than to use JPEG, you need to make sure that the compression is minimal. Based on this information, what image format do you think should be used for structure from motion? Using RAW files and converting them to TIFF is the best option. However, JPEG images with higher quality setting and lower compression should work well. Many cameras can take images in both RAW and JPEG format. If this is the case with the camera you are using, even if you decide to use the JPEGs, you should keep the RAW files as future advancements of the technology will allow you to reprocess the initial dataset and probably get an even better result. In the unit Understanding how cameras work, we covered the different lens types and the pros and cons of each. For structure from motion, the best option is to use the so-called standard lens with the 50mm focal length. Wide-angle or fish-eye lenses produce distortion and therefore you will need to calibrate the camera prior to processing your photos in the software. One thing you should always avoid is taking photos with variable zoom as this might confuse the algorithm in the processing stage. For this reason, you should either use a prime lens, in other words a lens of fixed focal length in which you cannot change the zoom level, or if using a zoom lens, you should set it to either the maximum or minimum zoom level during the entire shooting session. You should also use photos of the same shape and size and you should not mix portrait and landscape orientations. It is also important to note that the aperture should remain constant so as to achieve the same field of view throughout the capturing. To achieve this, you should either capture in manual mode or aperture priority mode, in which you set the aperture and the camera sets accordingly the other settings. It is good practice not to set the aperture higher than f11. You should also use the lowest possible ISO setting, since the higher the ISO, the more likely it is to have digital noise in your photos. The golden rule for structure for motion is that photographs should have an overlap of at least 60% or more. The first part of the process within the software is to align the images by finding common points. If there aren't many common points between the photos, processing will take longer. Sometimes the software will crash because the processing power of your computer will not be enough to cope with the information within the images or the resulted point cloud might have problems at the areas where not much information existed. In this example, you can see that each image overlap with two other images, therefore providing the same information captured from different angles. There will also be an overlap on the vertical axis since you should be aiming for a hemisphere around the object. Therefore, Photographs would also need to be taken by multiple levels on the vertical axis. The Lego video on the previous page will help you to visualize this better. Here you can see the overlap in an image dataset. A clay figurine positioned on floral foam is rotated clockwise so as to achieve a high overlap between its photo. You should note that having a higher overlap wouldn't cause any problems. However, this means that you will need more images to cover the whole subject, which in turn will increase the processing time and the computational resources needed to deal with more photos. When capturing an image dataset, it is good practice to include a white balance card and or a color checker to ensure that the colors you capture are accurate. These will allow you to create a custom white balance within your camera and use this information in an image processing software to calibrate your photos. We have covered white balance more extensively in the unit Understanding how cameras work. When processing images for structure for motion, the software will try to find common points among the different images you have taken. Any movement that may occur, resulted from movable objects, people, trees, will most likely cause you problems in the processing phase 
since part of the capture scene will have moved to a different place. Imagine, for example, that you want to capture this grocery store. Although this is likely to remain the same for the whole capturing process, people passing in front of it will be introducing new points in each of the pictures. Imagine, for example, that this is an image you have taken. Observe the position of the woman with the red dress. If she keeps moving, she may be in front of the door in your next image. Given that certain elements of the scene will be constant and others will be moving, this will confuse the software when trying to determine the overlap between the photos. Therefore, you need to make sure that your scene does not change throughout the capturing session. As said previously, the final 3D model depends on the photographs you have taken. For example, if your scene is half in shadow when captured, this will also be a feature of your 3D model. To avoid that, you need to make sure that the building or artifact is lit or shadowed evenly. If capturing outside, you may want to shadow the whole area or avoid the time of the day that shadows are cast over the subject. If however you cannot avoid them, then you should do the capturing at a time when shadows are softer. If capturing outside, where you don't have much control over the lighting conditions, you should prefer cloudy or overcast days. This, however, will also depend on your subject, since its material and surface characteristics may be better captured when photographed under sunlight. Also, if you see that capturing takes a long time and as a result light dramatically changes, you could do the capturing consecutive days and at the same time when lighting conditions will be the same. If for any reason you capture images that are over or underexposed, you should better discard them instead of trying to fix them in an image processing software. In order to have your model in scale and be able to get measurements out of it, you should include a scale bar or ruler in your scene. Alternatively, you should have a metric reference in your scene. In other words, to know the distance between two points so you can use this measurement in the processing software to accurately scale your model. These will allow you to get accurate measurements from your 3D model. What you can also do is to place coded printed markers to your scene that you can use later in the processing software as reference points to define the scale. These also help the alignment of the images. In the two links above, you can find a PDF of the targets that you can download, print and add to your scene, and the guidelines for placing and processing the calibrated scale bars developed by the not-for-profit organization Cultural Heritage Imaging. Although the guidelines are specific to these bars, the principles are the same for any type of scale bar you may use. We'll cover that in the following lesson. One of the most important things in the process is that you should never crop, resize or change the resolution of an image. The software processes the data sets based on the original information stored within the image and therefore, if you modify the photograph, there will be no correspondence with the metadata stored. On the other hand, Photometric modifications, such as brightness and contrast adjustments, do not affect the resulted geometry and therefore you can make adjustments as required for your scene. For this, you can use an image processing software such as Photoshop or the free alternative GIMP and or also adjust the brightness uh, of your dataset using the tools provided by the processing software. Structure from motion is generally a very flexible method that can work with different objects made of different materials and of different sizes. However, it goes without question that since the method is based on photographs, you need to have light, either natural or artificial, to capture your scene. Therefore, if you want to capture a dark cave, you will need either to light it using additional equipment, for example floodlights, or use another method, such as laser scanning, that is not affected by the absence of light. 
Another thing that you have to note. Reflective, shiny and glass objects are probably the most difficult to cover using structure from motion. This is because the reflections on their surfaces, or in the case of glass, their transparency, confuses the software in the processing stage. In some cases, you may be able to minimize reflections by putting some white powder on the objects. However, when working with fragile, sensitive, or ancient objects, this wouldn't be possible. As a result, you will need to position and adjust the lights, as well as your boards, fabrics, and other materials to minimize the reflections on the objects. Since each object is unique, there's no recipe for this. So, the process will be mostly trial and error. Andrew Fortune, Collections Photography Department Manager at the Corning Museum of Glass, presents some solutions in the presentation slides here. You will also find the references in the resources section below. One other option that could work in the case of shiny and highly reflective materials is to use a polarizing filter for your lens. This should be bought separately and has to have the right size so you can attach it to your camera lens. Here you see an example of how a polarizing filter can minimize the reflections. That's the end of the presentation. Here we cover the protocol that you need to follow to capture a structure from motion dataset. You need to spend some time to experiment with some test scenes and objects both indoors and outdoors. Be creative. You can start with an easy object, for example a billboard, a rubbish bin, a mug or your water bottle. If you follow the guidelines presented here, you should be able to get a fairly good dataset. In the following lesson, we're going to see how to process a dataset using the software Agisoft Metashape. Good luck!